Hello everybody, welcome to the first bonus part of Let's Play 428 Shibuya Scramble. Let's take the 428 pop quiz. Hopefully I can pass. Oh my god, am I actually gonna have to type in stuff? First question. The virus is approximately this many nanometers in diameter. What? Dang, I thought they were gonna ask me stuff like, uh, yo, um, what did this person do? What was this person's nickname? Like, God dang, um, let's be cute with it. <laughs> Well, <laughs> um, this is this is amazing. Okay, I'm going to brute force this, aren't I? <laughs> Okay, or we could just, you know, like, uh, do, uh, do, do 428, pop quiz, here we go, okay, oh good, they're doing screenshots, so I don't have to be spoiled on everything entirely, wait. Do they actually change the... Hold up. Oh, okay. All right. I found a different list that was apparently wrong? I don't know. Anyway, answering pop quiz questions correctly will let you read special episodes. Enjoy the tale of... Asao Ozu and Yutaro Sagawa. Huh. Alright. Well, maybe I won't be able to do the, uh... Like, sub-story I missed out then if I'm gonna be doing all, all these sub-stories. Okay. Ozu snarled at the young man who sat before him in the dingy little office belonging to Takarada Financing. Or dingy, rather. Do you understand what it means to break a promise between men? The men glared back at him. What do you want me to say, he muttered. Ozu had seen the same look plenty of times before and he despised it. It was the look of a man who hadn't realized he'd already lost. Ozu hated people like that more than anything. Five million and the interest on it hasn't been paid. When was the payment for the interest due again? Yesterday. Well, if you knew that, then how come you haven't paid it? Ozu's voice rose to a bellow that practically shook the windows. He couldn't tolerate anyone breaking promises. No exceptions. I understand. Despite Ozu's fury, the man seemed unconcerned. I'll work it off. I'm in shape. His upper arms sported bulging biceps. They were the arms of a fighter. Or if that's no good, I can always sell my organs, the man added nonchalantly. It struck Ozu as a ridiculous offer, the suggestion of a clueless youth. Listen, pal, you can't just up and offer to sell your organs. Your parents will want... You taking better care of yourself. I have taken care of myself, and so my organs. Stop jerking me around! Ozu lurched to his feet and kicked the table hard. I'm not jerking anyone around, I'm being serious! The man looked squarely back at Ozu. What did you spend the five million on? The older man grumbled. If I tell you that, will you wipe the debt clean? Of course not! Again, Ozu kicked the table. The young man shrugged. I needed some funds to set up a bank transfer scam. Oh? Ozu straightened up reflexively, picking up the scent of money. But a scam like that requires a fake account in someone else's name. Yes, it does. I tried to go through some black market channels to get one, but... Well, I just wound up losing my money over and over. The man continued describing how he'd blown through over a million and a half yen before landing the fake account. I figured that once I had the account, though, I'd be able to make something work. 
thinking that his fraud scheme needed a bigger team, the man tried to recruit some scam artists online. He ponied up three million to use for advanced funds for the effort, but once he'd given it over to the team he'd assembled, they had all skipped town the next day. Now desperate, he'd taken the remaining half million to illegally purchase a list of easy marks. Said list contained the phone numbers of several dozen elderly people who had fallen for such bank transfer schemes before. The man had tried making his way down the list, calling one number after the other. None of the numbers on the list, however, actually wound up connecting to anyone. Rather than craft his own fraud scheme, the man had fallen victim to one himself. You were looking for some suckers, but got suckered yourself, Ozu snar snorted. Why would he snarl? No, he snorted. Yeah, the man grumbled sullenly. Look, could you please just let me make a quick phone call? Phone call, huh? There's another mark I've been working on since this morning who just needs a little more coaxing. If I pull it off, I might be able to pay what I owe. There was no way this guy was pulling off a scam. From all he heard so far, Ozu was sure of it. But that made him all the more amused at the thought of letting this guy have his call. This I gotta hear. Go ahead, make your call. Ozu turned the phone speaker on, then handed the receiver to the other man. With a notebook in his other hand, the man dialed. The phone rang several times and then someone picked up. Hello? Grandma, it's me. Did you get the money? Oh, Massa, is that you? How's school going? I'm already working now, Grandma. Didn't I tell you? Oh, yes, that's right, that's right. How lovely. How's your homework looking for today? Oh, and make sure you come straight home and don't buy too much candy while you're out. The old woman on the other end of the line sounded completely senile. She was under the mistaken impression that this man was her grandson. So anyway, Grandma, you remember what we talked about last time? Did you get the money? Money? Was there something that you wanted? No, it's not like that. Do you remember our phone call from earlier? Phone call? What do you mean? These two weren't even on the same page. Ozu frowned skeptically as he listened to the back and forth. Remember I said I'd been in a car accident, I hurt someone really bad, and I need to pay a settlement. <laughs> Masa, you don't need to lie, you know. Why? The man looked panicked. I'm a... I'm not lying. It's all right, grandmothers can tell this sort of thing. But I'm not lying. I bet you really want to buy some new video game. It's okay, Masa. I've got enough saved up to buy it for you. Don't you worry. I've been all alone ever since your grandpa died, and so I'm just happy when you call me. Buying you a video game is the least I can do. The joy in the old woman's voice left the con artist at a loss for words. Your father and your uncles never came around to see me anymore. I'm so very happy you called. Thanks to you, I feel I might live another ten years. Forget ten years, I want you to see a hundred more years, Grandma. The young man managed to rasp. His eyes had grown blurry with tears. Masa? Yeah? Will you call me again? Yeah. Yeah, I will. That's a promise now. I will. I swear I will. Alright, I'll talk to you later then. The man hung up the phone. Oh, they'll, that'll make a, oh my god, oh, they'll make that into a movie for sure, Ozu said with a faint chuckle. You really have no sense for duplicity whatsoever. The man hung his head. But there's something even more unforgivable to me than that. Ozu took a step forward, looming aggressively above the other man. The fellow began to tremble. Real men don't break promises. Ozu snatched the debtor by the collar and dragged him to his feet. I'm going to have you work off what you owe me real slow. The man blinked in confusion. You're going to work under me for the rest of my life, and you're going to keep up your act with that old lady until she dies. Huh? I'm not letting you break your promise to call her. Suddenly a tiny hint of kindness showed through Ozu's gruff expression. Several years have passed since then. The younger man still makes the rounds with Ozu, still deep in debt. His name is Yutaro Sagawa. His schedule for today involves collecting money at the apartment of some broke actor, putting pressure on the president of a publishing company with cash flow problems, and then shaking down some shady guy who's trying to sell some weird diet drink. Huh. Oh wow, okay. So Sagawa ended up joining Ozu because he was bad at scheming. Alright then, 
and then Finn. How'd you enjoy the tale of the Lone Shark's first meeting? We hope you found it entertaining. Now here's some tempting info for you. In Osawa's story in the noon time block, rubber gloves appear at some point. During that scene, the background zooms away, right? Try waiting for that moment to finish, or movement to finish, and see what happens. Have fun with that and see you next time. Noon? And the background zooms away. Well, this is interesting. So noon, rubber gloves, and the that camera is going to zoom awesome. out. No, so next question. I ain't got time for that. Special episode 12. Oh, oh, they tell me that. Okay. Okay, yeah, the pop quiz is going to be its own part then. I mean... Granted, you know, I could just do that and the sub story considering I have like a four and a half hour video of this on my channel. <laughs> but I'd rather keep things like truncated. Like confined to their own like timelines or just keep things neat. All right, noon. Where's the rubber gloves? Oh my God, it's moving. It is, it was so faint. Okay. I mean, is something going to happen though? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I guess I just wait. Wait, wait, we got something. We. S something's appearing on the side. What? Um... What is that? I don't... Okay. A, re a recycle bottle saying arrow, 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 circle, circle, arrow? Oh wait, are those directions? Oh, 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 I, I'm, I'm getting something to write, write on. Sorry for bumping the mic there. Oh my God, it is getting dark outside. I think it's about to rain. Um, wait, okay. Um, I think I might know what this is because the little sub story thing that I missed out on, I'm somewhat spoiled on that like I just know what it is I just don't know anything about it like or how to deal with it um but I think this may tie into it so yeah I'm just writing this down one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right, 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 circle, circle, right. Okay. Interesting. Um. Well. 
How do I get back to the main menu now? Oh, we have a problem here. Oh, wait. Here we go. Well, this is intriguing. All right, pop quiz. Please start off on the second question. Okay, Detective Sasayama's pet name for his wife. I remember making fun of this. Smash Brothers is coming to my mind for some reason. Why is Smash? Oh, uh, me, me. Yeah, because I was up here like, oh, it's a me, like a uh, me chan. Yo! Oh, so I miss Tama. I know it's Maria, but still. <gasps> Maki Yoneda. Oh, no. One chilled curry soba and make it tasty. What are you talking about? Maki Yoneda snapped from the kitchen. Everything this old gal makes is tasty. She grabbed a bundle of soba noodles and tossed them roughly into the roiling pot. Humming a tune to herself, she tended to the soba. She heard another faint humming join in, seemingly from out of nowhere. I forgot what voice I gave her. All right, let's do this. The tiny voice had come down by Maki's feet. Another day for making delicious noodles. A different voice this time from the shadows of the dingy kitchen shelf. Yeah. A series of diminutive figures, each about the size of a pinky finger, leapt out from amidst the haphazard assortment of spice jars. Oh, she's insane. They lined up on the floor, these tiny little fairies, seven in total, all carefully keeping out of Maki's line of sight. There were food sprites that had come from Italy, and they protected the flavor of Dogen Hot Soba noodles. <laughs> okay. Their leader, Mario, specialized in meat dishes. Salvatore could track down fresh ingredients in the blink of an eye. Cheerful Antonio was a wizard when it came to sauce. There was Marcello, a wine connoisseur and the most sarcastic fellow in the world. Franco, the neat freak, loved a clean and tidy kitchen. None could outmatch the pasta making skills of Fabrizio, who had to fight touch. <laughs> Roberto, the quiet one, could tell you all about pizza dough. Maki set the finished bowl of chilled curry soba on the kitchen table. Now, although the woman's back was turned, the sprites added more salt and dashi stock to the noodles. In the blink of an eye, the soba seasonings were refined to perfection. Magnifico! With their work complete, the fairies hid themselves once again. Does why had these seven food sprites taken up residence at Dogen Hut? The story begins two years prior. Mario and the others had been dwelling in a three-star restaurant in Rome when they heard rumors that there were five-star restaurants popping up all over Japan. Naturally, as food sprites, they couldn't just sit idly by. Hey everyone, let's go to Japan! And so, heeding Mario's rallying cry, the gang snuck aboard a plane bound for Tokyo. My god. But after finally arriving at their destination, they were unable to find any five-star restaurants anywhere. By the time they realized that the rumors they'd heard had, in fact, been mere rumors, they were starving nearly on the verge of death. They wandered about aimlessly until they arrived in Shibuya. Then, as they tottered their way up Dogenzaka, the aroma of curry tickled their noses. The scent came from a soba restaurant called Dogen Hut, part way up the hill. The sprites peeked inside and saw Maki and her husband busily at work. Sneaking into the kitchen, they found that the scent of curry was wafting from a porcelain bow on the counter. This was Dogen Hut's house specialty, chilled curry soba. Despite their misgivings, the sprites stole themselves a taste. What is this? The food sprites looked at one another in surprise. The dashi, soy sauce, and curry all come together in perfect harmony, woohoo! The smooth and chewy noodles offer a different appeal than pasta. The group shouted in excitement, caught up in the moment. So taken were they by the chilled curry soba that they decided to settle down in Dogen Hut's kitchen from that day onward. But then the owner of Dogen Hut fell ill and passed away. After Maki took over her late husband's restaurant, it quickly became apparent that she had no talent for cooking whatsoever. Shockingly, she couldn't even tell the different, yes, the different 
between salt and sugar, rice wine and vinegar. Okay, wow, yeah, you definitely have no business cooking. And she had no idea how to make the soup for the chilled curry soba, sometimes tossing things like curry flavored rice crackers and meat and potatoes into the pot. If Maki were left to her own devices, the restaurant was sure to go under. We're the only ones who can save this place, woohoo, Mario declared. None of the others had any objections. The flavor of the chilled curry soba was worth any effort. And today, yet again, that specialty soba was delighting customers' palates thanks to the helping hands of the sprites. Okay, Maki called out, one chilled curry soba. Oh my god, bumped everything. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry for the wait. Mmm, as delicious as ever, ma'am. You really can't get this flavor anywhere else. Now at Maki's feet, the sprites frowned. We're the ones who made it, though. Maintaining the flavor of the restaurant's dishes was certainly worth doing. Recently, however, it had begun to feel a little empty. Nobody knew that it was the food sprites who made the soba special. Maki was the one who was always praised for how tasty it was. There was no finer joy in cooking than seeing the smiles on diners' faces. But despite all the sprites' hard work, no one ever had a smile for them. They needed to remain hidden, but the lack of recognition still left them feeling rather lonely. Oh, that's right, Maki announced brightly. There's been some talk about releasing a Dogen Hut recipe book. With a start, the sprites looked up at her as one. The old woman was clearly overjoyed. Uh-oh. What do we do? A cold sweat broke, a broke out across the sprites' foreheads. This was Maki here. She'd probably write about how she made the stock using curry crackers and stuff. But as busy as you are running the restaurant, do you even have the time to write a book? The customer asked between happy slurps of his soba. Oh, don't you worry about that, Maki declared with a broad grin. I'll get it written in my sleep. The customer blinked in disbelief. You can't write a book while you're sleeping, he said. Yes, I can. There are these little sprites who will write it for me while I'm in bed. Oh, come on. Now you're just talking fairy tales. The customer chortled loudly. Shocked, the sprite stared up at Maki. Wait, one of them whispered. Does... does she? Added another. Suddenly, Maki cast her gaze downward. You'll handle the book for me, won't you? She whispered. You... you've known all along? The sprite's jaws hung agape. Of course I have, Maki murmured with a grin and a chuckle. I don't know how to make chilled curry soba that tastes that good. So thank you. Because of you, my husband's restaurant has been able to go on. And when they saw the big smile on Maki's face, the sprites knew that all their effort had been worth it. Well, yes, we've got to help you out to then. Woohoo, Mario said. It'll take a little bit of overtime, but we'll write you a book for you, ma'am. I'm not sure I like the idea of revealing our recipes to the public, though, Salvatore mu muttered. And we'll have to put our hearts into the rest of the menu items, too, not just the chilled curry soba, Fabrizio added. Despite all their grumbling, though, the sprites couldn't keep their happiness from their faces. The, f the food sprites were real. Okay. <laughs> Did you enjoy our tale of Dogen Hut's unexpected secret? Shake off your amazement because it's time for some new info. In Tama's story in the 2 o'clock time block, that suit she's lugging around on her back sure looks heavy. Try taking a good look at her hauling that weight. What might happen? Happy hunting and see you next time. Okay. Should I go ahead and do all the quizzes and then go back to the... Yeah. Alright, took a note of what to go back and check for. But now I'm just thinking, like, what would have happened if I had to, like, pause on one of those screens, take care of something, come back, like, a few minutes later and see, like, what in the world is that on the side? All right. Next question. The discounted price for a miracle stone, including currency. Ah, oh, crap. Was it fifteen thousand yen? Okay, I kind of brute forced that one. Like, it wasn't 15,000, was it 10,000? I tried 5,000, like, okay. Oh, no. 
I was in France on business at the time, staying in the cheap apartment on the banks of the Seine. Monsieur Yanagashita, you must pay those 10,000 euros at once. Yeah, that was how Marcel Poit Poitier, Poit Poit Poitier, a general goods trader, greeted me when I opened my apartment door. It was the most unsophisticated bit of French I'd heard by far in the time there along the Seine. Uh, well, you see, this is all rather sudden. Two days earlier, I had purchased some health products from Marcel. We agreed that I could pay the 10,000 euro bill a month later. And now, here he was telling me I needed to pay up at once. Monsieur, if you would please, 10,000 euros right now. Marcel, I'm sorry, but I don't have that money, I replied with my own halt in French. We had a deal that I could pay a month from now, didn't we? That's not what I want to hear, Monsieur. What I want to hear from you is, we, oui, Marcel, don't worry, I'll have it right away. I haven't yet sold any of the health products I procured from Marcel. I was flat out of cash. I couldn't have paid up even if I'd wanted to. What in the world is going on? Why are you suddenly demanding that I pay right now? I think we're about to have a thunderstorm. Monsieur, I need that money, whatever it takes, by this evening. He pointed a finger at me. You absolutely must have it by this evening, otherwise you'll find yourself sinking to the bottom of the Strait of Dover. I'll be in touch. And with that, Marcel departed. Oh man, now what am I going to do? That bit of grumbling there was in Japanese. I don't have 10,000 euros anywhere. My reflection in the waters of the Seine looked miserably distorted. Yanugi? I looked up. There's only one person who called me Yanugi on account of not being able to pronounce my name. Isabel? The woman my heart had once burned for stood in the doorway. Isabel, what are you doing here? Work. I'll be here in Paris for a while. I see. What a coincidence. You're as beautiful as ever, I see. And your hairstyle is the same as ever, too. The sight of a familiar face bolstered my spirits at least somewhat. She may have firmly rejected my advances, but I still loved her all the same. I've been hearing a lot about you, Isabel told me. The businessman who hops around all over the world. Oh. I'm just always living on the edge is all, and when you're doing business with the world, sometimes even though you know it's dangerous, you need to leap off that edge. Well, so there's the product that I simply, oh wait, well, so there's this product that I simply had to recommend to you, here. Isabel pulled a doll from her handbag and presented it to me, okay, well that was her saying that, alright, alright, whatever. What's this? Isn't it cute? It's a mascot based on Indonesian folk art, don't you think they'd be a huge hit in Japan? It had bumpy green skin and bloodshot eyes. There were sharp claws on the end of its lizard-like hands and feet. Not only was it not charming, quite frankly, it gave me the creeps. Look, I'm sorry, Isabel, but I don't think I need something like this. Why not? Why not, huh? No matter how I looked at it, this just wasn't a design that would sell in Japan. Go on. Go on, push on its back. It's back. Give it a push. I did as instructed. The doll's arms and legs waggled almost apologetically. See? Isn't that marvelous? Well... My brows and as I tried not to frown in front of her. But she seen... No, well, since my efforts and her expression turned sad. Oh, you don't like it, do you? How many of these dolls do you have? I asked, feeling something like pity. Around 3,000 or so. Wow, 3,000? Okay, wow, it was actually getting pretty loud outside with that, uh, thunder. Uh, would you take them off my hands? Look, I'm sorry, but I really can't. But if some other opportunity comes along... I see. I guess I should have expected that with a doll this creepy. Isabel turned her back to me, forlorn. And then she muttered softly. I've been thinking of throwing in an extra 10,000 euros if you took them off my hands, but... Oh? What was that just now? Whoa, hey, hold on, Isabel, hold on. I hurried around in front of her. Could you repeat what you just said, please? Hmm? You said if I took them off your hands for you, I'd throw in 10,000 euros. That's it! I thrust my pointer finger toward or forward triumphantly. With 10,000 euros coming in, I'll be able to pay what I owe Marcel. Okay, Isabel, because it's you, I'll happily take those 10,000 euros. Well, I mean, it's the dolls, not the 10,000 euros. Please, give me those 10,000 euros. But the dolls, the dolls and the 10,000 euros. Okay, I'll bring everything here. How about tonight? No, now, now, before tonight. I can't do that. Tonight's the soonest I can make it happen. Guess I don't have much choice. I just have to make Marcel wait a little longer. I remembered that last part so that Isabel couldn't hear. So, uh, all right, Isabel, tonight then. 
Thank you, Yanugi. And don't forget the 10,000 euros. Don't worry, I'll have it for you in cash. Isabel held out her hand. I really do appreciate this. I'll see you later tonight then. I shook her hand firmly. Likewise, bonsoir. Looking quite happy, Isabel departed. Wow, looks like I got the 10,000 year old thing settled. I let out a breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding. When the evening came, Marcel returned. Do you have the money? No pleasantries, just right to done in me. I decided not to point out his impertinence. Oh yes, absolutely, I replied, grinning as I gave him a thumbs up. Really? Ha ha, you are my best friend. Now hurry up and hand it over. With a bright smile, Marcel held out one hand. Well, I can't give it to you right this minute. Why not? Didn't you just tell me you had it a few seconds ago? Please, you just need to wait until tonight. The 10,000 euros are coming then. Mad! Marcel snapped, red in the face. Please, Marcel, surely you can wait a bit. We're best friends, right? Hear me out. That's all I ask. Wait, is that actually the first swear word? In this game? I'm trying to think. I don't think they've actually sworn. Wait, was the shit dropped occasionally? How hilarious that like the first swear word I can like really recognize is in French. All right. You're not my best friend. You're a liar. He who will steal an egg will steal an ox. Look, Marcel, calm down. If you just take it easy and wait until tonight, I can give you the money. I promise. Would you prefer I take that swim to the Strait of Dover right now instead and give you nothing? I put Marcel's rail into an end. Daddy finally agreed, but he insisted on waiting with me. And so we both waited for Isabel there in that cheap apartment. I sat on the floor holding my knees and Marcel followed suit. I suppose you must despise me for this, huh? He mumbled. He picked up a spoon that was lying on the floor near his feet and hurled it through an open window to the sien. It disappeared with a sad, lonely plunk. I can't blame you, he said. What with how I showed up out of the blue, demanding that you pay up? Next, he tossed an alarm clock into the river. There was another plunk as before. Okay, the rain is actually pretty loud. I might not be able to continue recording right now. I suppose I owe you a proper explanation, Yanagashita. Marcel was going to throw the TV remote next, but I reached out to stop him. Tell me, Marcel. So, I've been settled with some merchandise that's a real pain, he began. The light of the setting sun shone upon his face. I can now see the bags underneath his eyes. The man looked exhausted. They say that whoever owns this stuff is cursed. His eyes quivered with fear. They say also that the curse stays with you until you can foist it off onto someone else. He continued. I had no idea what he was talking about. Why can't you just throw the stuff out? If you do that, the curse only becomes more powerful. Now he was trembling dramatically. Whatever had spooked him, he wasn't his usual self. That was for sure. What happened to you because of this curse so far? I asked. Well, for example, I am loath to oh I am loath to recount here what Marcel told me next, but suffice it to say it was horrifying. Oh my, that's awful! And so I marked those things down to what's practically a giveaway price just to be rid of the lot. I never sold a single one, and the warehouse storage fees aren't exactly insignificant. Marcel shook his head from side to side, the expression positively haggard. So then I thought maybe there was some fool someplace I could push the inventory off on to just to give it away if I threw in ten thousand euros to go with it. Someone had to be dumb enough to take it, I figured. I see. That's why you need the money so urgently, then. At last, I understood. But it's all right now. A little while ago, one of my colleagues called to say they'd found just the right sucker. That's good to hear. Yeah, so I need to go with them to hand over the money along with the product inventory. I see. You're a lifesaver, Yanagashita. Merci beaucoup. No, no, uh, Darien, Marcel. Hmm? Huh? What? What was that? Come again now. But man, it's hard to believe someone was dumb enough to actually want this stuff even with 10,000 URLs thrown in, Marcel said. He let out a little chuckle. Uh, hold on a sec. Uh, Marcel, can I ask you something real quick? What is it? This colleague you mentioned, one who found your sucker. Is that a woman named Isabel, is it? Oh, you know her? Yeah, Isabel's great. But a real knock for finding marks. She's quite the lady. I did the mental math. I give 10,000 euros to Marcel. Marcel gives that 10,000 euros to Isabel, along with the cursed merchandise. 
Isabel gives me 10,000 euros and the dolls. I give the 10,000 euros to Marcel. Um, Marcel, these cursed goods, do they happen to be creepy green dolls? Oui, monsieur. He flashed a broad to the grin. I slapped myself on the forehead good and hard. Scammers trying to scam scammers. Dang. But it looks like the storm is past, so that's good. <laughs> Did you enjoy our tale of Dogen Hut's unexpected? What? Oh. Okay. Did you enjoy our tale of Yadagashiya's bittersweet younger days? If you slapped yourself on the forehead along with him, we've got some new information for you. In Kano's story at the 15 time block, there's a scene where, well, three time block, there's a scene where Kano and Stanley are running. Maybe try sticking around for a bit. Take a good close look and we'll see you again next time. All right. Okay, the hint has been written down. God, I hope our basement doesn't flood again. All right, next question. Fill in the blank. You're the one making the argument here. What? Okay, looking up the answer. <laughs> okay, apparently the answer is extreme. I, I, I would not have figured this out. Like, at all. Like, if I probably brute force the Ua virus thing, I probably would have got it, like, <laughs> at some point. I probably would have tried to start... Well, no, I was starting off with the zero, but... I mean, at some point I would have got to 100, but yeah, this one, no. I was, ex I was not expecting, like, questions this detailed. Oh my god. The Kinder Partners, I forgot about them. Um, excuse me, do you have a moment? Tape recorder in hand, Chiaki called out to a pair of young girls who were standing by the statue of Hachiko. Each girl carried a lollipop half the size of her face. What do you think about Shibuya? The girls looked at one another. Um, do you not understand the question? Chiaki pressed. Children slowly licked away at their candy. Not really, one of them said at last. Chucky was taken aback by the girl's grown-up tone. Hmm, yeah? Yeah. The girls nodded at one another, their faces disapproving. Huh? Chucky was confused. What's going on? Do we know you, lady? Huh? Uh, see, this is like people keep saying that adults nowadays have no common sense. Yeah, he's off on the small talk. This is the first time we've even met, after all. Didn't your mom teach you any manners? Chucky took a step backward and wrapped her arms around herself as the children stared at her coldly. I'm sorry to have upset you. Ah, uh, it's okay. Everybody makes mistakes. Being treated like a child by a small children made Chucky blush bright red from embarrassment. Their arrogant reproach left her too flustered to fully process the situation. <laughs> so, what's up? One of the girls went on. Excuse me? Chucky said warily. You're asking about Shibuya? Uh, yes, of course, um... Recoiling some more under the children's gaze, Chiaki chose her words very carefully. So, uh, what do you two think about the city of Shibuya, uh, perhaps? The pair quickly lowered their eyes, their expressions forlorn. Used to be so nice way back when. Way back? This when was way back for these two. Nowadays Shibuya's gotten all dead quiet. Yeah. Used to be back in the day, you could just stand around here and see something interesting go down, day in and day out. Jack was utterly dumbfounded by the girl's ostensible worldliness. Worldliness, rather. Oh my god. She listened in fascination as they continued. Yeah, but even that was maybe something that sort of hinged on your mood. I hear you. Maybe it's just our mindset that's changed, that's all. So I'm guessing you've got tests coming up? Yeah, my mom just will not shut up about nagging me to study. I'm about to start practicing for interviews myself. Oh, it's too early for that. Besides, if anyone messes up the real thing, it's the parent. At some point, Chiaki had become a bystander to the girls searing back and forth. Man, I wish I had more freedom to do stuff. 
I've started taking piano lessons to help with the enrollment tests, too. Guess you'll never wind up rich if you don't go all out. I hate money. Rich people always have these awful sucking in faces. Yeah, a while back I saw a father and son buying an entire box of trading cards, and they both looked hideous. Yikes. Kind of a sad story, though. The kid looked like he really wanted something else instead. That's the impression I got anyway. Ah, and as usual, the parent was completely oblivious? Yeah, and so the kid had to put on this fake smile of appreciation and everything. I know how that goes. Same, though. Chiaki felt increasingly inclined to leave, but she wasn't sure how to do so gracefully. Parents these days, she reflected, were foisting off an awful lot of things onto their children. He seemed completely ignorant of how much of a burden was too much. Facts. As she stood vacillating, the conversation continued. But yeah, when our kindergarten teacher plays the organ, there's some real soul to it. It's so moving. Oh, I love her organ playing. Even if it doesn't have anything to do with test prep, you need to learn how to play an instrument. Yeah, maybe I ought to change up my way of life. Jackie began to feel ashamed of herself. A shame that since she'd been so simple in her thinking as to expect this interview to be easy. These kids were having a really tough time of things. Feeling pathetic for her own shallow short-sightedness, Chiaki sunk down to the pavement. Well, hey lady, what's the matter? One of the girls asked. Chiaki hung her head. You got a tummy ache? Want some of this? The other girl held out her lollipop. No, no, it's not that. Chiaki was only barely managing to contain her tears. Are you worried that this interview is not going well? You shouldn't let it get you, or shouldn't let it get to you. It's not the end of the world or anything. <laughs> the cheer on the girl's face has brought Chiaki a small flush of consolation. Yeah, keep your chin up. We can keep going with the interview. We can talk about whatever. There's this place I grab food from a lot that my mom doesn't know about. Maybe we can talk there. They've got these stupid tasty agar jelly strips. Yeah, my mom tells me I shouldn't spend too much on snacks, but you've got to sneak a little of that into your routine. Two girls gently patted Chiaki atop the head. She could tell it just wasn't going to be her day. <laughs> that was so good. Oh my god, I actually have to, like, multi-tap to get the right hint. Did you enjoy our tale of these precocious preschoolers? None of us can get go back to our childhoods, but we can give you some good hints. In Achi's story, in the three-time block, Achi and Hitomi are flagged down by Minorakawa. Take a close look after that. This path leads to a bad ending, so the clue might be tough to spot. Are you flipping serious? Okay, um... A bad ending clue. Wow. Okay. Hint has been written down. This is... Okay. That one's going to be annoying to get to. Hitomi Osawa's blood type. Oh. But wait, what would be the... I mean, this is easy, but... Will Bombay just suffice, or do I have to say Bombay blood? Oh, okay, cool. See, what? more like that. More easy oh stuff God. like that. Come on, man. <gasps> Miku! A straight right came her way just as she let down her guard. The blow caught her in the chin, and for an instant she saw white. She was driven back against the mesh cage, and knee strike hurtled toward her. She managed to change positions just in time to dodge, and close distance with her opponent. Man, she's tough, Miku thought to herself. Bride's openweight champion, Crybaby Mizuho, was a dyed-in-the-wool, tried-and-true fighter. One of Miku's eyelids felt like it was badly swollen. She was having a hard time seeing. Mizuho's hearty frame was little more than a blur, and the punch Miku had just taken had left her distinctly unsteady. What if this other woman rushed and tackled her? No doubt Miku would wind up down on the mat, where she'd be pummeled over and over. Perhaps her opponent would instead make use of her expert footwork to deal out some more precision strikes. With the hurt Miku had already taken, okay, I just saw lightning outside. Okay, wow. Um, dealing with that would be difficult as well. Miku was in a proverbial corner. Oh, how she wanted to just drive a fist right into Mizuo's big mouth. What are you going to do, Miku? Did you come this far just to lose? Mizuo closed the gap. 
Her 180 centimeter tall, 80 kilogram frame came charging in. A thin smile showed in her doughy face. Doughy? Okay. Miku had first seen Mizuo fight one year earlier. Her face radiated weakness and she cried when she got hit. Hence her nickname, Crybaby Mizuo. But through her tears, Mizuo fought desperately, managing in the end to pull off a joint lock that won her the match. The crowd went absolutely wild at the Crybaby fighter's underdog victory. But Miku was not convinced by Mizuo's performance. Mizuo was assuredly much stronger than she'd seemed. She'd taken karate lessons at a local dojo up through middle school, and she'd been on her high school intramural wrestling team, and lately she had taken up jujutsu. There was no way a woman like that could be such a crybaby. Oh god, we're, it's raining again. We might be in the eye of the storm now, okay. She'd been fighting at half her potential in order to make things more fun for the audience. Biku knew that, since the matches at Bride were part of the spectacle, making things fun for the customers was important. Even so, she wanted to see the champion fight at her full strength. And so she fought her way up the ladder to get that chance. After the winning match that put her in position for a shot at the title, Miku had grabbed the microphone and shouted to both Mizuo and the crowd. Mizuo! Next time you're fighting me, and we're fighting for real. Afterwards, the manager had been furious. By saying fighting for real, you made it sound like the other matches here at Bright are all fixed. It was true that the matches were indeed for real, with no outcome decided ahead of time. But Mizuo's crybaby persona was just an act, even if it was an entertaining one, and she spent the first part of each of her fights putting out a lot of fake tears. Miku scowled at the manager. I don't want to fight crybaby Mizuo. I want to fight Mizuo. I want to fight... No, I want to fight that's full force from the get-go. You dumbass, roared the manager. Take one look at her. Amongst the slender framed fighters on Bride's roster, Mizuo stood out as bulging and burly. And not even by the most charitable standards in the world could her face be called pretty. Mizuo was on the roster in the first place because of her crybaby character. If she gave that up, she'd be giving up her position at Bride. Miku fell silent. Was getting a legit fight out of Mizuo impossible then? She fretted anxiously about it until the title match finally came. Once the fight started though, the other woman in the octagon was an old crybaby. Mizuo unleashed a mighty punch the instant the gong sounded. The blow hit Miku like nothing she'd felt before. The impact shocked her even through her guard. Mizuo then shot forward like a rocket, tackling Miku against the cage. Miku clung to the, her tightly to avoid being taken to the mat. Mizuo whispered into her ear, You wanted a real fight? Challenge accepted. Mizuo released her, then retreated to the center of the octagonal ring. Then she held out one hand, gesturing as if to say, Bring it on. A confused uproar rose from the crowd. This wasn't how things usually went. Miku could feel every cell in her body jumping for joy. Yeah! She rushed at Mizuo with all her might. But the match quickly developed into a rather one-sided affair. Soon, Miku was struggling just to avoid getting KO'd too quickly. Her opponent was strong. Stronger than she'd imagined. Mizuo grinned as she charged forward. Miku was out of options. Was the bigger woman coming in for a tackle? As soon as Miku prepared to defend against a tackle, a wide hook came her way instead. She barely managed to deflect it. Then Mizuo rooted her feet and launched into a flurry of punches. Miku was astonished by the fury of the attack. The champion threw punch after punch without bothering to guard herself. Finally, Miku was able to follow up with a single counter punch of her own. She landed a clean hit right on the bridge of Mizuo's nose. A stream of blood poured out from one nostril. With a gleeful grin, Mizuo stuck out her tongue and lapped at her own blood. She set her feet once more and threw another punch. A powerful blow clipped Miku in the temple, and her head reeled. Enraged, Miku retaliated with a punch of her own. Neither of the two budged as they traded blows. Before long, amidst the cheers, Miku and Mizuo were merely pummeling each other. There was no skill, no technique, just two bulls butting heads. Miku's molars clattered, her lungs felt like they might burst. She was at her body's limit. Just a little longer. It was hopeless, she knew that, but she had to hang in there. Just one more punch, she told herself again and again. Just one more punch. Only halfway conscious, she continued battering back at her opponent. There was an especially loud cheer from the crowd and then suddenly someone grabbed Miku from behind. Stop! Stop! It was the referee. Mizuo was sprawled out at Miku's feet. Victory by knockout with a right hook! 
Even after the ref said it, Miku could scarcely believe what had happened. She stood there in a daze for a while, then Mizuo came stumbling over to her. You got me, she said, fair and square. As soon as she saw the look of gratitude and respect on Mizuo's face, tears started dreaming down Miku's cheeks. Yes, dreaming. She tried to hold them back, but they just kept coming. Hey now, only one of us gets to be the crybaby, Mizuo said, her voice husky with emotion. Tears had welled up in her eyes, too. The two clung to one another, weeping. I'm so glad I was able to get a real match in in the end, Mizuo whispered into Miku's ear. For several months after that, Miku defended her title. While she was warming up backstage one day, the manager came in, carrying a cardboard box. Package for you, Miku! The sender was Mizuo. The box was packed full of oranges. Mizuo had quit the day after their title match. Evidently, she'd gone home to take over her family's farm. Miku peeled the skin off of one, pulled off a section, and ate it. The vibrant, striking, and bittersweet taste, so very reminiscent of their fight, filled her mouth like a little explosion. Huh. Alright, well, that was... No, I already saw that one, dang it. Did you enjoy our tale of Femme Fatale's forging a friendship through fighting? That's a tongue twister. Well then, put up your dukes, because you've got some new... We've got some new info for you. In Minorikawa's story, in the 16 time block, Minorikawa takes a taxi to Heaven Publishing. He passes some strange writing on the road. Maybe take a closer look? Keep your eyes peeled, and we'll see you next time. Alright, let me write that down. In my copy book. Okay... Question 6. Yanagashita is managing director of this company. Oh god. I was about to say Heaven Publishing, but no, that's Toyama. Um, Alright, let me look it up. Yamato Health Food. Okay, so Yamato Health Foods. Um, yeah, um, I would not have got this. Nor would I have really known where to look in game. Man, this is a tough quiz. All right, so F, O, O, D, S. All right, what are we about to read about now? Oh, Susumu versus Kiryu. The day that Achi came back to SOS, the day when, for the first time in a long time, SOS became whole again. Let's go back two weeks before that fated reunion. The gang was in the midst of a minor quarrel. But we have to set a proper example. The pool hall fell silent at Kiryu's aggravated outburst. Provoking the new second in command was a fine way to wind up victim to the guillotine. So the other gang members remained tight-lipped, warily looking on. Come on, Susumu, you know I'm right. Susumu didn't flinch under Kiryu's glare. Set an example of what? All you want to do is get rowdy because you feel like it. Look, just step aside, I got business with that little punk behind you. Behind Susumu was a skinny teenager, barely more than a boy. He wore a look of abject terror, like a rabbit caught in a lion's gaze. What exactly is so fun about finding different excuses to terrorize your friends? Susumu asked. Kiryu snickered mockingly, then grinned. Hmm, good question. Guess it's cool messing with guys who joined up with SOS after I did. The conflict, as usual, had started more or less over nothing. Each night, members of SOS gathered at their pool hall in Yoroharajuku. There was no set meetup time or anything like that. Around the time the place was teeming with other gang members, Kiryu would turn up. Susumu generally appeared shortly afterward. But today, the last person to show up had been the kid Susumu was currently shielding. As the young fellow quietly took a seat, Kiryu had suddenly blown his top. The hell you think you're doing? The kid froze with fear as the ferocious shout. 
but his cringing demeanor only poured more fuel into the fire. Whoever shows up last has got to apologize, you know. As Kiryu reached for his favorite makeshift wooden cudgel, Susumu had interposed himself. Susumu, are you seriously trying to tell me that SOS doesn't have a proper pecking order? That's not what I'm saying. Susumu continued to stare Kiryu down. Oh, I'm conflating the voices. Sorry. Uh, what's it matter? You don't understand anything anyway. Oh, no, that's Susumu. You know, wh whatever. They're, they both sound the same now, okay? They both smoke 12 packs of cigarettes a day. Kiryu suddenly rolled up his right sleeve, then sat down and set his elbow on the table, his right hand raised and open like a claw. Want to sell this with a show of strength? A glimmer of challenge shone in Kiryu's eyes. You're on. Susumu sat down opposite him. Planting his own elbow on the table, he reached across and clasped hands with Kiryu. Kiryu squeezed back as if threatening to crush Susumu's palm on his fingers. If I win, he said, you let me do what I want. Someone stepped out of the crowd to act as a referee. He's one of Kiryu's cronies. At once, the bar was gripped with excitement, as if a championship game were on the line. Waste that punk, Susumu! Come on, Susumu, you can do it! The leader had a strong showing of support from the crowd. You got this, Kiryu! But the upstart's backing section wasn't exactly small either. Heh, <laughs> looks like we've got them all worked up, Kiryu said. He picked up an empty beer bottle with his free hand and smashed it against the edge of the table. Shards of broken glass littered the tabletop between their arms. This ought to make things more interesting. Yeah, I bet it will. Referee leaned in, giving the pair's tightly clasped hands a quick tap. Ready? And go! The competitor's biceps bulged. Both men started to shudder visibly. Their arms seemed locked in place, neither giving way. Kiryu flashed a broad, leering grin, a vein popping out against his temple. Man, you really are a wuss. You ain't leader of material. You think so, huh? Susumu answered through gritted teeth. If you don't keep him on a tight leash, SOS will fall apart once it's finally gotten big enough. Kiryu grunted as he started to bend Susumu's arm downward. You thick or something? Whoever said anything about SOS getting bigger? Susumu replied. He struggled to force his arm back up. The walls echoed with the sound of people cheering Susumu's name. Bolstered by their support, he mustered up his last reserve of strength. But still, his arm would not move. Kiryu's grip held him like a vice. At the best you can do, some leader you are. And Kiryu put all of his strength into his arm. Susumu's knuckles thudded against the table. Thin shards of glass stabbed into the back of his hand. Yeah! Kiryu let out a triumphant cry of victory. Cradling his bloody hand, Susumu grimaced back at him. Well, that settles it fair and square. Now I'm going to teach that kid a lesson. Once more, Kiryu reached out for his cudgel. The young fellow tried to bolt away. Stop right there, Susumu called after him. Huh, you finally come around then, Susumu? Kiryu asked. He twirled the piece of wood around as he sauntered slowly toward his prey. You stop right there too, Kiryu, Susumu added. Kiryu paused in his tracks. Hey, what gives? The kid tilted his head questioningly. Apologize to Kiryu, Susumu said. The youngster blinked in disbelief. I said apologize, Susumu repeated. Yeah, okay. The kid bowed his head deeply. I'm sorry, Kiryu. That should settle things, right, Kiryu? Kiryu went red in the face. What the hell, man? Are you kidding me? Enraged, he stepped forward to swing his club at the kid. I told you to stop. Susumu drove his bloody fist right into Kiryu's face. There! He snapped as Kiryu staggered backward. I think that's enough violence for one day. The look on his face was nothing short of blood curdling. That's still not enough for you. Next up, we can settle things with our fists. Once again, he and Kiryu were staring daggers at each other. With a click of his tongue, Kiryu was the first to look away. Alright, I'll back off for today. Tossing aside his club, he stomped out of the bar. So, um, thank you so much, murmured the kid apologetically. His gaze was fixed on Susumu's hand. Even as he told the kid not to worry about it, Susumu could feel doubt welling up like a storm inside him. Kiryu had said for today. At some point, the two of them really were going to wind up coming to blows. And Susumu couldn't lose that fight. No matter how tough Kiryu was, Susumu wasn't going to let him become the leader of the gang. Especially not considering who it was who put Susumu in that 
position in the first place. With a newfound determination, he clenched his injured fist, even as blood continued to stream down. Well, he was ready. He was ready. Did you enjoy the tale of a heated showdown between two rivals? Well then get ready for some fancy footwork because here comes some sweet new info. In Norikawa's story in the noon time block, the journalist flags down the man from the knick-knack shop as he's passing on his bicycle. Try waiting until after the background slips away and see what happens. Have fun looking and we'll see you next time. Alright, got that one. And now, question seven. 22nd performance by the theater troupe The Wandering Angels. Okay, looking this one up. Okay, apparently it was Au Revoir. I had completely forgotten. <laughs> Shinsuke Orai. If I had to compare it to something, it would be gum stuck to the bottom of a shoe. I, Shinsuke Orai, first came across the impulse when I was young. It's good that you got to see this while you were still little, my parents said to me. We had gone to see our, our one of Shakespeare's four great tragedies, King Lear. The material was a bit difficult for me at my age. Even so, the dazzling sets, the sublime music, and the true-to-life acting stuck to me, or, no, struck me to the very core. How amazing it all was to think that something like this existed in the world. It was a setting I wanted to hurl myself into. I wanted to move others at the same impulse that it moved me. From then on, these thoughts were never far from my mind. And then, when I was in second grade, I made my debut as a stage director. When the school was deciding the program for the arts festival, I eagerly proposed King Lear. The rest of my class was, of course, rather flabbergasted, but as no other suggestions were put forth, Lear was chosen. I raised my hand to volunteer as director. Since the rest of the class was unsure what a director even was, no one raised any objections. It was my direct or directorial debut. I poured my heart and soul into it. Then did I realize that I had started down a road of hardship. We had 10 days for rehearsal before the opening. Why don't you know the lines I told you that you had to have them memorized by today? Sorry, I forgot. You forgot? You think that's going to cut it? I lashed out at a classmate who had yet again dropped his lines when we were already well into the rehearsal. How someone could fail to remember three measly lines was beyond me. Thinking back now, I encountered an awful lot of actors over the years who simply refuse to listen to what their director tells them. What makes him so reluctant to faithfully follow directions? Are you really okay with the prospect of flubbing your lines during the actual performance? You can say them yourself, I'm busy. The only thing you're busy with is TV and games. The class suddenly fell silent. I leaned back, sneering at them. A few of the girls began whispering to one another. Ugh, look at him acting all high and mighty when he's not even class rep. Yeah, he's not even a teacher. He can't go around telling everyone what to do. Everyone hates the director. I learned that from the television programs I watched to learn more about drama. The director would pelt the actors and backstage crew with vitriol, toss out absurd instructions without compunction, and even hurl ashtrays across the stage. It was a job to perform without mercy. Directors don't lash out because they're bad people, mind you. But you have to be something of an ogre in order to assure that both you and the audience are satisfied when the curtain falls to attain the sense of accomplishment that comes from true artistic achievement. Enough of the yammering. In my rage, I searched around for an ashtray. They don't keep those in the elementary school classroom, however, so instead I grabbed and hurled the nearest pencil case. It's only natural for a born director to behave with such intensity. No sooner had I thrown the case, however, than the homeroom teacher snatched me by the scruff of my neck. For long, I was in the staff room getting a lecture crammed down my throat. Then I was made to return to the classroom and apologize to everyone. Still, I had not lost my passion for successful production of King Lear. I would not be disheartened by such a minor setback. At rehearsal after school the following day, the teacher addressed us. 
In order to take some of the burden off of young Mr. Orai here, everyone will direct the production together. Yes, ma'am, the class replied as one. It was beyond absurd. Actually, I was vehemently opposed to the idea. Democracy has no place in the world of art. The enjoyment comes from a clash of individuals who excel in their given roles, each refusing to compromise one iota. But the teacher would have none of it. It's all well and good to take this seriously, but we don't want a repeat of what happened yesterday. Let's all be friends, alright? Let's be friends? Does she think that fine art can be created by being friends? I can only grimace at such a laughable misconception. And so began our new rehearsal system. We would practice a scene, then everyone would offer their opinions about it. You need to look at this person we're speaking to, I railed angrily. Where you look is important. Others chimed in from all around. Oh, what does it matter where you look? What if we try reciting our lines while jumping? Say, I'm playing a tree. Can I have some dialogue too? I'm trying to figure out if it needs more yikes or more ta-da. Nobody could tell at this point whose instructions they should follow. From the very outset, it was chaos. Everyone just said whatever they wanted. There's no way I'm holding hands with a boy. This costume looks dumb. How about something more like superhero-y? Give me a new part. I should play the lead. Taste the wrath of the mighty Cornwall Slash. Yeah, pew pew pew, ba boom. Stop all the rambling, stick to the script. My anger had finally boiled over. We're all supposed to offer our opinions though, right? Yeah, all right, quit your belly aching. You're such a belly aker. Belly aker, belly aker, belly aker. This mad whirlwind, which no one in their right mind would call rehearsal, continued for days. A whole week passed. At last, once everyone had finally realized that the new approach was getting us nowhere, I was reinstated as the play's sole director. There wasn't much time left before the main event. Never before had I thrown so much gusto into my craft. What's with the monotone? You need to put more feeling into it. You're not reading from a textbook. I was not one to go easy on my actors. But, but, I'm shy. No excuses. You're not bringing enough realism to the part. You need to give it more oomph. Okay, fine, I'll try. Thanks to my fierce directing, the others had improved bit by bit. With just a little more, just a little more patience, a truly grand sense of accomplishment could be ours. At long last, I was sensing a real response to my work. And then, it all changed. The boy who was playing the back half of the horse suddenly took down his pants. His underwear came down next, then he squatted down on the spot. His brow creased with the strain of effort. He was really doing this. The entire class flew into an uproar at this rather sudden development. Girls ran away, boys broke out laughing, the teacher rushed in unthinkingly to cut both hands under the young fellow's backside, and I just stood there dumbstruck. Once everything had finally calmed down, I went to talk to him. What were you thinking? I demanded. You said you wanted more realism, so I figured the horse should take a dump. I had no words. Wahaha! <laughs> that sure counts as real, alright, someone called out. The class erupted in raucous laughter. The energy drained from me in an instant, and I collapsed to the floor. Real. Was that what real meant on the stage? I couldn't deny that taking a dump qualified from a certain perspective. The bowel movement itself had definitely been genuine. It had been live. It gave a certain ambience. Was that... was that wrong? It hadn't been the kind of realism I'd been after. I've been hoping for something else, for a sense of tension that went beyond mere fabrication that expressed the clashing of life's various emotions. In my confusion, I clutched my head. Was this how my art was to fall apart? You stupid amateur! Before I knew it, I had blown my top, launching into a wild rant. I don't recall what happened next. I didn't recover right away and wound up missing school for a while. The school arts festival went on without me. I heard it was well received. Was it art? Or no, what is art? What is drama? What is man? A miserable pile of secrets. What is the world? Whenever I try to ask and answer these questions, I always think back to that experience, back when I was young. If I had to compare it to something, it would be gum stuck to the bottom of a shoe. No, an AM radio broadcast washed out with static. No, a cut of meat, but that's been steamed for too long. No, perhaps more like a sudden or sodden doormat. No, maybe it's like, yes, something like a love letter written in the dead of night. That was not expecting the story to go to uh, that length. 
Did you enjoy our tale of artistic agony? Not really. Well, if you're serious about the craft, we've got some good information for you. In Kano's story, in the noon time block, Kano and Sasayama chase after the kidnapper. Try waiting on that scene for a while and see what happens. Have fun with that and see you next time. Okay. Onward to question eight. Maria needs to be quarantined to prevent this. What? I mean... Spread... The... I was about to say spread the virus, but they probably want me to be specific. To prevent spread, or it should be spreading. So what? Okay. What, what, what answer do they want? Let me look this up. Okay, I'm a bit mad about this one. Um... Okay, so the correct answer is pandemic. I mean, it's correct, but with the question this open-ended, like, could have been anything from a phrase to a single word. Cheery! There are two sheets of paperwork here. They're printouts of the material found on some underground internet site. Contents are classified information from a Koshi Pharmaceutical Co. Limited. In all likelihood, they were leaked from a PC that had been infected with some kind of spyware. Is this her talking or? Oh yeah, no, Sherry. I'm about to say herein. Herein are the full details of the dreadful contents of those pages. Analysis results for Chiriko Osugi, Koshi Pharmaceutical Co. Limited Research and Development Division. Top secret. Handle with care. One findings. It's been confirmed that a previously unknown enzyme is being produced within the body of Chiriko Osugi. Hereafter, the subject. Enzyme has been named hypersustinant chiris or chirisi. Ch chiriasi? After the subject. Two effects. The main function of hypersustinant chirisi is the digestion and breakdown of triglycerides. When compared to the enzyme lipase, which possesses the same functions, hypersustinant chirisi is capable of breaking down fats for more efficiently, well, far more efficiently and without the stimulation of exercise and is effective in preventing excess fat accumulation within the body. However, once the subject's body fat percentage drops below 40%, her body no longer secretes the enzyme, the trigger for the change is unknown. 3. Potential Business Plan Market the enzyme as a diet food product or medicine. Especially when administered under strict medical protocols, the enzyme should be effective in markedly reducing body fat without need for surgery. So Akoshi was monitoring Cheery. <laughs> okay. Four remarks. Plan 24 hour observation of the subject for a 10 year period underway. The reason that hypersustinant Cheery is no longer secreted after body fat drops below 40% to be discerned as soon as possible. From this paperwork, it's evident that one of Japan's leading pharmaceutical companies is carrying out surveillance of private individuals in secret. Is this constitutional? Does Japan have a constitution? Uh, the contents of the second page are even more shocking. Chiriko Sugi Behavioral Inducement Proposal, Kushi Pharmaceutical Co. Limited, Research and Development Division, Top Secret, Handle with Care. General Overview. Chiriko Sugi, hereafter the subject, is to have her dietary and exercise habits engineered. Goal, maintain the subject's body weight above 40% body fat. Two, reasoning. According to recent measurements, the subject's body weight is trending downward. The cause of this trend has been established as the subject's growing attention to her own diet. It has also been confirmed that the subject has taken massive doses of the dietary supplement, Burning Hammer. This could lead to substantial delays in research into the hyper-sustenant Methods. Further discussion is required to assess ongoing behavioral adjustment methods, but the following have been approved on a temporary basis. In addition, other methods once deemed effective should be employed without delay. There is no upper limit on our expenses. Given the urgent nature of the situation, progress reports shall be issued directly to the project supervisor. 
X. In Thai's confectionery store operated by Five Star Patissier to open shop in subject's neighborhood, Tomigawa. Sponsor food products with excessive amounts of fat and sugar in the guise of product samples. Provide financial support for an open additional for or open additional franchises of restaurants touting eat X servings and your meal is free. Oh my god. Oh my god. It was all a big conspiracy to keep Cherry chubby. Oh my god. Host an eating contest. Four remarks. As a full assessment of hypersustenant Cherry has yet to be completed, any hindrance to further research must be eliminated. Oh my god. We have also received reports that competing companies are aware of the subject's unique characteristics. Given the 10 years our company has already spent on the discovery of the subject and research into our unique physiology, the subject must be prevented from weight loss by any means necessary. We must attain a monopoly on hypersustinate cherisy. These are the contents of the two pages. Perhaps it's not mere happenstance that a number of tasty restaurants have popped up around Tomigawa recently. And free food samples are frequently available there, often given outright on the street. There are regular eating companies or competitions held in Shibuya too, and the number of all-you-can-eat restaurants has been expanding. Maybe it's all just part of a plan by Akoshi Pharmaceutical to research a young woman named Chiriko Osugi. I cannot believe this. What? What? <laughs> Did you enjoy our tale of Akoshi Pharmaceutical's mysterious plan? If you're still hungry for more, we've got some new info for you. In Achi's story during the one time block, a cat creeps into the dark storehouse. Try taking a close look at that scene. That happened? They intersected with Tama like that? I know they intersected with Maria after the costume was off. Where's this? Okay, onward to the next one. I don't recall that. And again, that was the one o'clock block, so that was ages ago. Thank you. I don't know. Question nine. Frank belonged to this section of the Chicago Police Department. I mean, I remember what his role was, I just don't remember the name, so excuse me. Okay, um, Bomb and Arson Squad. I was gonna say Bomb Defusal. Granted, it wouldn't have been hard to, like, go back to Stanley's little thing and see this, but, eh. And I, no, no, not Bomb and Defusal. God dang it, Bobby. Uh, bomb and arson squad. Squad! <laughs> Koji Kuze. <laughs> huh? What was that? Koji Kuze stood in his private. Oh, oh my god. What? Sitting in his private study furrowed his brow. The look on his face was much like the one he wore when he made an appeal to a task force HQ. Not to a task force HQ. Why can't I read today? I'm sorry. But his gaze was fixed on his video camera's LCD display. There was his son, Tatsuya, standing on third base, giving a triumphant fist pump. Huh, that's odd. He round the videotape a little. Kuse had purchased a video camera to record the tournament his son had competed in. It was able to take footage at full HD with 5.1 channel audio. With a trembling finger, Kuze pressed the play button. I mean, granted, that was a big deal back in 2007, so alright, fair enough. The footage started playback right at the point where his son hit the ball up between right and center field. That's it, kiddo! Run! Run! Kuze really had heard it. Whose voice was that? Oh. Someone alongside him had been murmuring the words as he filmed. Gonna run until your heart gives out, sport. There hadn't been anyone nearby who spoke in such an excitable childish register. Oh, that was him. 
Otherwise, he'd have known right away who the strange voice belonged to. He's hearing his voice for the first time on recording. It's always an experience. In the video footage, his sons sound around at second base. Attaboy, Tats! Keep running! Every third champ! The unsettling voice was even louder now. And that Tats in there, it sounded oddly familiar. Just who the heck was this weirdo giving cutesy nicknames to his son? You did it, Tots! Woohoo! Yeah, that's my boy! Huh? My boy. So then that means... Kuzay swallowed, his mouth suddenly dry. No, it can't be. That's my voice? Do I really talk like that? Kuzay was flabbergasted. No, no, my voice can't sound that way. The video camera began to shake in his hands for the first time in his life. Kuzay had been made aware of the childish squeaking he made when he got excited. To hell with this! He lifted the camera high above his head, but before he could hurl it against the floor, he reconsidered. No, he couldn't do it. His son's accomplishments were stored inside that camera. Still, he needed to make sure no one found out about his verbal affectation. <laughs> uh, too late for that, fam. If his son heard him sounding like this, Kuze would lose every shred of dignity he had as a father. What should he do? Is there some way he could raise or erase his voice from the tape? He thought desperately for a way. Maybe he could mask it with other sounds in editing. No, that wouldn't work. If he wiped away the crack of the bat and the cheering of the crowd and just replaced it with a musical soundtrack, it would still be pretty awkward. Oh, I don't know what to do. Because they slumped down into the floor, buried his face in a cushion, and kicked his legs up and down. At this point, He'd have to take the footage to one of the forensics researchers to see if they could do something with it. There'd be disciplinary measures for it, misuse of lab time if he ever got found out, but risking that was better than letting people discover that he sounded like a hyperactive 12-year-old when he got worked up. Suddenly, the door opened. Dad, let me see that video. Because son strolled into the study. No, I can't do that. Is it raining again? God dang. Why not? Um, well, there's this voice. He tried to hide the camera as he rambled. A voice? Oh, that's no big deal. Kuzay blinked, his eyes in disbelief at his son's words. Came in here earlier and watched part of the footage already. Kuzay's jaw dropped. Tatsuya, so then you, you heard that voice? What voice are you talking about? This time it was his son who blinked his eyes in confusion. Well, so, uh, there's this pretty childish voice... Kuzay's son broke out chuckling. Wait, Dad, did you seriously not realize that voice was yours? Huh? Dad, if you're worried about how you sound like a kid sometimes, everyone's known that for a long while. Kuzay's jaw gaped even wider. Uh, come on, Tats, you gotta tell me this sort of thing sooner. Okay. That was kind of lame. Did you enjoy our charming little look at the daily life of father and son? Well, then we got an exciting little clue for you, kiddo. In the Sawa story during the two-time block. Getting my pen ready. Osawa imagines what might happen if the virus spreads throughout Shibuya. There's an odd command hidden in his imagination. See you next time. All right. Onward to the next one. How many questions are these? I, I don't remember if it said anything at the beginning. Uh, now it's question 10. The person... This person called Maria Osawa at... <laughs> what? At such and such 57. 19 block. That was during the final... Yeah, that was during the final chapter. I mean... Yeah, 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 that did happen during the standoff. Um... I mean, it's... I'm not wrong. Okay. 
so we go by the alias then? All right, that that one. Um, whatever, I got it right, but that 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 should have been out far. I mean, come on now. Kuchiro Kadayama, it's coming up on 12 noon. The hour of the devil, the particular devil known to the support center staff as K. The coming call light on my phone flashed. I gulped reflexively. Then taking a deep breath, I hesitantly pressed the accept call button. Thank you for calling Chun Food Service Center. This is Tanabe speaking. This is Katayama from Cho Nippon Printing. I had to swallow back the squeak that tried to rise in my throat. I had been right on the mark. The phone call was from K indeed. Oh, wait, no. This is from somebody from from the food places perspective? Okay. Hello, he asked. Yes, how may I help you today? I'm calling about your instant ramen, salt and chivalry. This again. I sighed inwardly. Kadayama had been calling about the same thing for close to an entire year now. You hardly needed to bother listening to know what he had to say. Why is my ramen still not finished after steeping in hot water for three minutes? The noodles were still too hard to be edible. I'm very sorry to hear that, sir. My response was right out of the manual. Would you be able to provide some more details, sir? I continued. I called about the same thing just last week. Did you? My apologies, sir. I tried to keep my voice as chipper as possible. Then what Katayama was a nuisance. He was a man driven by logic. Treating him the wrong way could lead to disaster. Some of the staff here had wound up listening to his matter-of-fact complaints for upwards of 12 hours, passing out with their phones still in their hands. Very well. For the sake of accuracy, I suppose I ought to explain again, Katayama said. If you would, sir. First, I peel open the lid. I tear open the seasoning packet and powdered soup base and sprinkle them into the noodles. I add the hot water, close the lid, and wait three minutes. But the noodles are still far too hard. That's a familiar sequence of events. I heard it before. Begging your pardon, sir, but are you perhaps beginning to eat before three minutes have passed? Certainly not. I wait three minutes, exactly. Are you checking a clock when you do this? Yes, my body's internal clock tells me when it's been precisely three minutes. The urge to ask him if he was messing with me grew. Sir, perhaps instead of your internal clock, you might want to try using a clock in your home that you have on hand? I have a personal policy not to use clocks or watches outside of my work. As I'd done before, I fought off the verge to tell him what a ridiculous policy that is. I'm sure it wouldn't hurt just once. Perhaps you should try using an actual clock to track the time, sir. My body's internal clock is accurate. A three-minute unit of time is not something I would mistake. No. Clearly you would. You are. You have to be. I wanted to scream. If the product is not properly ready to eat in three minutes, that makes it defective. If it were possible, I would have liked to stick my head through the receiver and watch Katayama's three-minute timing myself. I imagine the lecture I'd give him when he started eating before three actual minutes passed. Then, in my frustration, I had a sudden idea. Sir, perhaps we can check your internal clock against my clock here and test whether there's any discrepancy. Pretty good idea if I do say so myself. If that will convince you of my claims, then no, I do not mind. Yes! It was time to make this guy eat crow. If there's no discrepancy, however, I expect a proper apology. Now I felt like I'd stirred a potential hornet's nest. Ah, uh, what the hell. There was no way this guy's internal clock could measure three minutes on the dot. Alright then, sir. Let's begin. I picked up the stopwatch that was on my desk. Internal clock diagnostic. This may be sudden, but here you're going to see how, just how accurate your internal clock is. Exactly 20 seconds after you press the button, a message saying 20 seconds have elapsed will appear on screen. How precisely can you judge a 20 second interval? Alright. Let's begin. Please press the button. Okay. Oh, dang, I was off. I, I was, um... I was short. I was like, okay, now we're on 
18 and a half seconds. Like, oh, wait, nope. We're, we're at 20. All right. Okay, 20 seconds have elapsed. How did you do? Was your body's internal clock accurate? It, it, was, it was off by a second and a half. I stare in astonishment at my stopwatch. Well, Katayama asked, his voice composed. Three minutes exactly, sir. Not a second off. It was impossible. I was trembling. So, now do you believe me? My apologies, sir. I hung my head in defeat and heard a stifled chuckle from the other end of the line. Tell your supervisor that your product is defective. And that's when it began. The folks at Chun's Food Product Development Department began work on a secret project. The project's name? Anti-K. Based on Katayama's incessant calls, a reworked version of Salt and Chivalry was created. The new label the team had devised listed adjustable times based on noodle thickness and desired texture. Two minutes for hard-boiled or thin noodles. Three minutes for standard. Four minutes for soft or thick noodles. That ought to shut Katayama up. The product development team was proud of its creation. Of course, even after the new version of Salt and Chivalry was released, Katayama wound up calling to complain again. But that's another story for another time. Yeah, he seems like one of those, let me speak to your manager types. You enjoy our tale of the cutthroat behind the scenes world of product development? Now it's time to give you some choice information. That's just common decency. In Achi's story, in the 14 time block, there's a scene inside Gigo where Achi takes a punch from a debt collector. Take a good hard look right before that scene and see what happens. Oh, right then. So I take it we're done. So now to just go and look up all of these different things. What? what? Okay, uh, this method was used to crack the laboratory password. Dang, so what, are we gonna have like 15 or 20? Um. What was, cause no, they were mentioning all of the different things they could have did. I was about to say brute force, but no, like she said she wouldn't do that. They would have to use an alternate way. Side channel, that, yeah. Thank you, computer science. Alrighty. Huh? Wait, what? No, that... It wasn't brute force, it wasn't... Cypher, it wasn't... Okay, let me look this up. Okay, I'm mad about this one. I needed a dash. How many of these are there going to be? I wasn't expecting this to go so long. Makino. Seguru so Makino's life was one of conflict. Playing factions against each... Each another. Okay. Crafting subtle interpersonal manipulations. He had done whatever was... was nah. He had done whatever was necessary to rise up within his company. He'd even deceived close colleagues and sold out superiors who had helped him on the way up. By winning victory after victory on his chosen battlefield, he managed to become corporate director at Akoshi Pharmaceutical. But he still needed to remain alert. If he let his guard down, he'd soon lose his position to the next guy who came along. To keep his finger on the pulse of industry politics, he always made a point of putting in an appearance at functions he was otherwise disinclined to attend. Executive Director Makino simply must come along with me to this place I found. It's got a bunch of cuties I'm sure you'll be smitten with. This particular occasion, Makino's companion was a fellow who became a real nuisance once he got some liquor in him. The director's worthless re wordless reply was a simple deep furrowing of the brow. Oh no, Mr. Makino, don't worry. I know you detest that sort of thing, I really do. But this isn't going to be like that. It won't be like what? Even after drinking heavily, Makino never lost his composure. 
but he learned early in his career that acting drunker than he was often led to gleaning valuable information, so he let himself sway a bit as he spoke. Well, why not come with the understanding that you'll be surprised? I promise you, sir, you will not regret it. Why well, can I have half a mind to spit in the guy's drunken face in hopes it would shock some sense into him? Nonetheless, he was interested in the technology the man's company possessed. Like it or not, he was along for the ride. Well, if you put it that way. Hey, taxi, the man called out without waiting for Makino to finish his reply. A cab promptly stopped to pick them up. Makino had assumed they'd be heading to some popular hotspot like Ginza or Rapangi, but instead his companion directed the cab toward the suburbs. Ah, and here we are. Makino was dumbfounded by the sight of their destination. They got out of the car in front of a dingy, multi-tenant building with no signage out front. Surely he hadn't been brought someplace illegal. With a wary eye, he looked over at his companion. Don't worry about it, I'm sure you'll like this place. The man opened the door. Peering cautiously inside, Makino blinked in disbelief. What the hell? The interior design scheme was typical of an upscale cafe, aside from the fact that there were cats all over the place. What is this place? This is the cat cafe. Meow meow. <laughs> the man replied. <laughs> okay. The cat cafe. Meow meow. Makino echoed the words reflexively as he tried to process what he was seeing. Isn't it cute? The man beamed broadly. Oh. Oh my. Makino felt a big bright smile coming on. No, no, he mustn't. He quickly suppressed the urge. Makino was extremely fond of cats. Due to his wife's allergies, however, he hadn't been able to keep one of his own. Director Makino, is this not really your thing? The man had taken hold of one of to hold of one chubby cat's forepaws, posing the feline like a lucky cat statue. No, I I certainly don't dislike it. Makino managed to keep his poker face up. May I ask how you knew I liked cats? I saw the framed photo of a cat that you have in your office. Uh, I see. That silly old thing. Still maintaining his aura of calm, Makino struck a fluffy calico's back. No, not like that, Mr. Makino. You need to pet more gently, and they like it when you rub them underneath the chin. I am well aware of that. Makino suppressed his initial response and instead offered a curt, Ah, uh, alright. Scritch. Rub rub. Scritch. Rub rub. Calico let out a throaty hum of contentment as Makino's fingers got busy under his chin. It was so cute! Too cute! Makino had half a mind to get down on the floor and start rolling around. <laughs> Pardon us. Two young men, seemingly the managers, approached, taking care not to tread on any of the cats. The, the special course you requested is ready. Let's go, Mr. Makino! Makino's companion joyfully hopped to his feet. What is this special course? <laughs> it's a secret. You might get a little dirty, so take off whatever clothes you can. Take off my clothes? What for? What in the world are you planning on doing with those cats? I found an unsettling mix of anticipation and unease. Same. Hesitantly, he followed the others into a tiny private room. To step aside and feel free to lie down and relax. With that, the managers departed. As per his companion's instructions, Makino stripped down to his briefs and tank top. After flopping down on the floor, he could hear excited voices coming from the room next door. Uh, ah, yes, amazing. Wait, what? Was well, the whole cat cafe thing just a front for some licentious backroom business? Had he been tricked? He needed to get his clothes back on right away. Sorry to keep you waiting. Abruptly, the door opened and one of the managers poked his head in. Let's begin. This may be a bit ticklish, but please try to relax as much as possible, and don't move too much. The manager gently set the cat he was holding atop Makino's abdomen. Huh? Then another on his chest. One in the crook of his arm. Then one on each thigh. Wait, so then, this is... Yes, it's every cat lover's dream. The manager grinned brightly. This is the special course, the cat futon. Before he knew it, Makino's entire body was engulfed in more cats than he could count. Ah, uh, a joyful sigh escaped his lips. Now, finally, 
Makino knew who he truly was. Conflict was never what he truly wished for. He wanted something fluffier, softer, warmer. This is heaven. This took a turn I was not expecting. Everything I've ever wanted is right here. Makino was enraptured. The cats on top of him occasionally milled about, purring and shifting position. Whenever they did, Makino would let out a tiny little breath tinged with pleasure. Hmm, oh, oh, kitty, kitty, kitty. Suguru Makino, age 59, executive director of Okoshi Pharmaceutical, a man who had enemies both inside and outside his company, a man who sometimes contended with the nation itself. Hobbies include the cat futon. I mean, that's how it is with a lot of, like, big CEOs and stuff. It's like they have a sort of weird soft spot for something or they are just really into like this one sort of like really niche thing or just really big into femdom because it like, I don't know, it's sort of like they're so used to getting everything and people just like kowtowing to them and like just always being dominant and on top and ruthless that they all have like a little soft spot for something to remind them that they're like human or like just to get a sense of vulnerability because i remember seeing this thing like how there are a lot of like ceos and stuff who have like private dominatrixes and stuff for like femdom sessions it's it's fascinating anyway Let's get that hint. Did you enjoy our tale of a corporate warrior taking a little break? There's some information for you because you're about to work some overtime. What? Um. Susan A's story? Okay, in Susane's story, during their first meeting, a nervous Takia inquires whether he can ask her name. See what happens if you hold off replying for a bit. We'll keep things on hold for you until then. See you next time. Susane has a subplot? Did I miss something in this game? Wait, what? Okay, so, um, that was another hint. Susan A's story. Congratulations, you've cleared all game content. What do they mean, Susan A's story? I don't. And these are the hints. Okay, so when I went to the uh, second hint they gave me, I discovered a little something during that scene. And yeah, considering this part has already gone on a pretty long time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut things off right here. So see you next time when we go to the various other um, like segments that we need to get to in order to uh, get the remaining codes from that recyclable bottle.
Some of these might be a little tough though, not going to lie. Especially the ones where I don't think I have the, um, like what one of them did say like a scenario that I don't think I actually encountered. So I'm just curious about something here. The list of bad endings here. You can check for hints as to why things ended as badly as they did. Oh my God. It shows me how many bad endings are in each thing. And I can use this to my advantage to figure out. Oh my God. I was doing well on Osawa. Um, but yeah, like just figure out like, okay, that happened like right there and that happened right there. So there's going to be an ending in the middle. Well, I'm, Okay, Minorikawa has quite a few. Maria has some. I was okay. I was doing fairly decent on Achi. Um, Ta Kano has a a few that I missed out on. I was wow. I was getting all of his. Um, but yeah, I'm just looking at this because. I want to make sure because the game did like in, in those hints, it did mention that there were a few that were along bad endings. I'm going to have to check back to make sure about which one is which. Not to mention for an alternate ending, I'm going to need more bad endings. So yeah, I'm going to have to work on that. But yeah, um, see you next time for more. Let's play post game of 428 Shibuya Scramble. Goodbye.